especially in this roller coaster weather. This so good to see you here. My name's Linda Orsoletto. I am the City Club Board President this year. So we really do want to thank you for making City Club part of your day. It's so important to us. Again, talking about weather, which always seems to be a topic of conversation. Um, so things are going to be a little bit different today with our forum. Uh, we do have only one speaker and he's going to be joining us via Zoom today. Kim and the board made the tough decision, maybe not so tough, but just because of the way the weather is, like why risk his life to come over here? Uh, we don't want him coming over the past to be able to do that. And isn't this great with technology that we can do this? So just hang tight a little bit. Um, and I want to thank our sponsors for um, helping us out today. Um, you always hear the, well, we couldn't do this without our sponsors, but you know what? It's not just lip service. We really couldn't do this without our sponsors. And they not only support us financially, but they also give us a seal of approval by saying that they support City Club and what we do and our mission. So I am going to read through some of our sponsors right now. These are our gold and platinum sponsors. We do have a full list on our website and you may have also seen them on the screen, but I am going to read those to you right now. So our gold and platinum sponsors are ASI Wealth Management, the City of Bend, Central Oregon Community College, the Desert Pine Group at Morgan Stanley, OSU Cascades, St. Charles, Pacific Source, Central Oregon Association of Realtors, and Brooks Resources. Now, in addition to our sponsors, I wanted to mention the fact that we have about, we have a 14 member board of directors and we also have many committee members who are helping City Club be the best it can be and make this experience the best for you. So, could all of our committee members and board members please stand. Thank you so very much. And if you're interested in becoming uh, more involved with City Club, these are the people to speak to. And I'm looking in the back of the room at Kim Gammon, our executive director. We could not do this without her and all of her coordination and she's great with technology, making decisions. So Kim, thank you and please, please stand. Okay, and um, so you may have seen up on the screen our new values. So we redid our strategic plan and to be able to follow that strategic plan more closely, we have come up with our different values. So each month we are going to go through one of those and this one that we have chosen to talk about specific, specifically today is objectivity. We are all human and bring our own perspectives into any conversation. There are more viewpoints than we could ever bring to the stage at one time. However, at City Club, we strive to provide programs that are credible, neutral, and unbiased. And that's really what City Club is all about, having those conversations where you hear other people's perspectives and hopefully take away something that maybe you haven't learned from them before. Okay, so now getting to our forum. Thank you for being so patient. 
So this is Dr. Moore. He is our only speaker for today. He's going to talk and share his wisdom, and then um, in the last 20 minutes, it will be open for audience questions. And uh, Kim and Amy Sabadini, who's with our programs, um, volunteer will be going around the room with a microphone, but please, we ask that you keep your question succinct and very civil. So about Dr. Jim Moore, get ready for this. Okay, he serves on several roles at Pacific University here at Forest Grove, including Associate Professor, Director of Political Outreach at the Tom McCall Center for Civic Engagement. He's the Acting Associate Dean at the College of Arts and Sciences and the Acting Director for the School of Social Sciences. He has taught on international relations, the U.S. in world affairs, Middle East, international political economy, and U.S. foreign policy and conflict. And he also teaches topics including state and local politics and political parties. But there's more. He is currently writing a biography on our country's first Arab American governor, Vic Aitia, who was our governor from 1979 to 1987. So please welcome Dr. Moore. legislatures that actually come from these new districts. In the country as a whole, there are actually very few places that are so tightly gerrymandered. Remember, gerrymandering is drawing the districts to include what you want to include in there. Named after Elbridge Gerry, uh, uh, Massachusetts governor, um, somebody looked at one of the districts that was drawn when he was there and said it looked like a salamander, and so they put together Gary and Mander, and then we made a soft G, so gerrymander. There you go. Very few places are so tightly gerrymandered, this makes a huge difference. They tend to be in states that are much, much more partisan than Oregon. So in Oregon, we're not really tightly gerrymandered. If it becomes an issue, it's kind of where you draw lines with populations and, and what, that are quickly growing. So in Bend, you have seen that. I am sitting in Washington County. We have been seeing that for the past 30 years. Where do you draw lines uh, and, and those kinds of things? Oregon is just not as bad at this as other states are. We still do it because the temptation is great. The absolute temptation is great. But that's the, the issue with independent redistricting. Take it out of the hands of the politicians, put it in the hands of the citizens. There are a number of places that have put these districts in place. And what we discovered in the 2022 elections is that about half of them put together systems that were not anywhere near independent. For instance, it was fairly common at the state level for the governor to be able to veto what the independent districting commission had said ought to be, or the legislature to say, no, we're gonna take that power back. So independent on paper, but then the partisan groups come in and say, no, it didn't work out. We're going to take back that power and draw the lines we want to. So doing it is not impossible, but it's much more complex than people really think. So independent redistricting. The next one, and this is also, I, these are tied for my favorites. Open primaries. So it's gaining traction across the country. Oregon is now one of the few places with a completely closed primary system. So that simply means unless you're registered in your political party and your party has a primary, you cannot vote in those primaries. So Republicans are the only ones who can vote in Republican primaries, Democrats in Democratic primaries. In Oregon, with the way our state law works and the way we view political parties as more or less private organizations, those private organizations can vote themselves to open up their primary. We've had in the past, for instance, Republicans have opened up their primary or Democrats have opened up their primary, not to the other main party, but to anybody who isn't the other main party. So unaffiliated voters, come on in and vote in our election, uh, in our primary system, that kind of thing. But by and large, Oregon closed primary system. Most other states are going to open in some form or another. Washington and California are the ones nearby that have forms of this. 
Washington has had this for about 90 years. So we've got a lot of data about how open primaries work. Are they, do they create different legislatures, for instance, than you would see in a closed primary system? All those kinds of things. Washington and California have the system where when people go to vote, they get a single ballot in the primary and the top two vote getters, no matter who they are, go through to the general election. So generally in those states, the top two vote getters are a Republican or a Democrat. But in districts that are heavily Democratic or Republican, the top two vote getters will sometimes be two Republicans who will go through. So uh, you may have been paying attention to Washington's uh, district number three, Vancouver, that was one of the really barn burners that took place um, in uh, 2022. Uh, a Democrat won the seat after the Republicans had held it for a long time. But going into it, we thought that it would be two Republicans, the incumbent, and then a Trump Republican, who would be number one and number two. But it turns out there were three Republicans in that primary. They kind of all got an equal amount. And so the Democrat, who was pretty weak, actually got more votes. And so it was a Democrat and a Republican in the actual general election, and the the, the Democrat won. Um, but that's, that's what can happen in, in both of those systems. Evidence in 90 years worth of evidence in Washington state, and then California just looking at it and other places that have these open primary systems, it does not increase participation in primaries. Now, what am I talking about with participation? Oregon has a general participation rate of anywhere, it's, it's generally 50%-ish. We might be in the 40s, we might be a little bit above 50, but it's, it's generally half of our voters will turn out in the primary. In some of the primaries that are coming up, you're going to hear presidential primaries uh, in different states, Super Tuesday is in a few weeks, that kind of thing. It's pretty common in those states that their primary turnout is less than 20%. And in some of the crucial states, it's been less than 10%. Having an open primary does not necessarily mean that you get more participation. It simply mixes up who actually votes. So it's not just Republicans on the Republican side, Democrats on the Democratic side. It's the Oregon or the Washington, California system where there's a single ballot, or we open it up to anybody, you, you pick a Republican ballot, no matter your political party, you vote on the Republican side, you know, what, whatever it is. But the evidence suggests it does not increase participation in primaries. The evidence also suggests, this is looking at, especially at Washington state, it does not lead to less partisanship. Uh, the legislature in Washington state is just as partisan as any other legislature around, um, not the hyper partisanship we're seeing in, you know, like in Tennessee, where they kicked out some of their own members and then they got voted back in and all that kind of stuff. But it, it, it does not lead to less partisanship in those elected bodies. Um, so it gets the idea is it will get more people in, but it's not the number of people. It's kind of the type of registered voters who will take part because it's open. So maybe the number isn't bigger, but who actually votes might change. So what does it do? It does break some of the power of political parties. Um, political parties hold these primaries because they wanna be the ones who choose who their standard bearer is in the general election, which makes perfect sense. Open primaries, takes some of that power away from the political parties, puts it in the hands of the people who actually turn out to vote. So it takes it away from a central committee, for instance, and puts it in the hands of the members of the party, or if it's open, whoever you've decided to let into that system. It's not clear where that power actually goes, though. Um, we'll talk about in, in a little bit later here in the United States, the parties have actually gotten weaker. It's no longer Tammany Hall in New York 
or Tammany Hall or or the the Daily Machine in Chicago, they would pick who would run. They declared they were going to be the winner before the election took place, and they'd make sure the vote showed up. We don't have that kind of power with the political parties. The political the the, the power has shifted to the candidates themselves. That's one reason why we pay so much attention to how much money has a candidate raised, because it's up to that candidate to get their message out there, not the political party to do the same thing. It's all on the candidate. And so we're voting for candidates as people, and it may be a Republican person or a Democratic person or a Libertarian person or whatever, uh, but it's on the the people to actually uh, run their elections. So this you know just highlights that candidates have been the major players in primaries and general elections for decades. Political parties have been weakening in a big way since the early 1970s. Uh, a combination of Watergate, the Chicago uh, 1968 Democratic Convention, and huge reforms in how money was raised. Uh, for instance, putting, we'll get to this in just a bit, uh, putting limits on how much people can contribute to a national campaign, that shifted the power away from political parties and put it in the hands of the candidates themselves. For Oregon, though, open primaries is the way to get the most unaffiliated voters into the process earlier. There is an argument out there, and I think it's a pretty valid argument. The unaffiliated voters, this biggest chunk of voters we have going towards the majority of voters we have right now are shut out of deciding who will actually be on the ballot when the general election comes about in November. Open primaries will solve part of that problem. I say part of it because uh, people who are unaffiliated voters vote at a lower rate than people who are registered with political parties. How much lower? It's kind of stunning. In 2020, both Democrats and Republicans in that, in that presidential year in Oregon, over 90% of Democrats and Republicans voted in the general election. That's stunning. And remember, I'm the one who has the bias to everybody needs to take part so we get better representation. Fantastic. Let's go for that extra 10%, but fantastic. Unaffiliated voters, that biggest chunk of voters, it was about 30% less. It was down in, a, in the 60% range. So unaffiliated voters, there's more of them. But in effect, it looks like they're less committed to the system or less engaged by the system or something. So they vote at a much lower rate. Would taking part in open primaries get them more involved and raise their turnout? We don't know. I think it's an experiment that was is worth running, but it's, it's an unknown out there. But open primaries would get the most unaffiliated voters into the process earlier. Okay, now a couple of uh, uh, reform things. You've talked about them here, so we'll go through them kind of quickly. So ranked choice voting, this is going to be on the 2024 ballot. There are a whole bunch of different ranked choice voting uh, systems out there. Um, at the university um, where I have all those, those titles, acting this and acting that, I now run all the elections within my college for who's going to serve on which committee. Um, it's a nightmare. Figuring out who's eligible, big long lists, all these kinds of things. Ranked choice voting may be a way out of this nightmare for me simply running those little elections. But I have to work carefully with one of our mathematicians who's a specialist in voting systems. He knows Arrow's theorem inside and out. And he and I are going to sit down and figure out what's the best ranked choice system that would work for what we need. The Oregon proposal is a pretty simple one. People will get a ballot. It'll list everybody on it. You rank as many of those as you want. We do. We run the first uh, run of the ballots. We see what places people are in. If nobody is above 50% plus one, then the lowest one drops out and all their second place votes are then allocated to everybody above them. And you just keep going until you get somebody who gets the most votes, uh, the majority. So it's pretty simple. Um, I'm one of the people here in, in Portland, I'm one of the people on election night who calls elections. Um, I won't be able to call elections <laughs> because of this, simply because 
we don't know who's actually voted in Oregon until all the ballots have been counted. And remember, vote by mail means those ballots now are just postmarked on election day. They've got a few days afterwards to come in and then a deadline by which they all have to be counted. So we won't know in, in, in any ranked choice system, we won't know if there's an absolute winner or if it's going to go to round two. And that's all going to be on a computer until about a week later. So anything that's vaguely close and there's not an outright winner, it's like, yeah, well, we'll see in a week when we actually get all the ballots in and can start going through round two and all those other kinds of things. Okay, so ranked choice voting is becoming more common. It's still pretty rare around the country. Um, it has not led to less partisanship. And the example of that is Maine. Maine actually is interesting. They've done ranked choice voting in, in a variety of ways, experimented for a while. Maine has a strong tradition of nonpartisan voting for statewide offices. So any, any governor you remember from Maine and some members of Congress may have been an independent. That's part of their culture. There's independents. It's actually the independents tend to be a little bit more Republican when you look at their policies, but they're not Republicans. They're not Democrats. They're independents. But even in Maine, when you look at things, it has not led to less partisanship in the Maine legislature or anything like that. So ranked choice voting is out there. Um, it has some great promise, uh, but remember Arrow's theorem, it's not perfect. It's not necessarily going to bring in more people. Um, we'll have to see if it does that. It has not in places like Maine. Um, it may make it so that, you know, combine this with an open primary, you could get some really interesting things. But thinking those through is, 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 is a lot of thinking that needs to go on. And then the last thing, campaign finance reform, which you've also talked about, the most common type of election reform. Why is it the most common? Because it's the easiest to measure. There's money. Let's go measure it. So the big push towards campaign finance reform, as I alluded to earlier, was 50 years ago. Um, it was the post-Watergate era. What do we do? This is when the Political Action Committee, the PAC, was invented. It was part of a federal election reform law that passed Congress. This is when the Federal Election Commission was created, uh, part of that same law. You know, all those kinds of things. And so here in Oregon and in other states, they have also said, ah, let's do that for our state elections and local elections. Oregon has had campaign finance reform. We passed it several times. It's not even close when it goes before the voters. But then the Oregon Supreme Court has ruled repeatedly it's not the case, it's not constitutional in Oregon. And the reason is fairly simple. The reason it's not constitutional in Oregon, we don't have freedom of speech. We have freedom of expression in our constitution. And that freedom of expression means that no matter how you look at it, giving money is a form of protected activity. Just a couple of years ago, the Oregon Supreme Court cleared the way for us to legally, within constitutional bounds, basically they overruled previous Oregon Supreme Court rulings on this. They said, no, you can limit uh, campaign finance for a variety of reasons. We're not going to do that. It's not our job. But here, you, the entities in Oregon, go for it. And so uh, there have been local efforts to do that in some cities and counties. Um, at the state, however, the legislature, uh, we're now on the third legislative session that's really had this, able to do this, and they've done exactly nothing on it. Which, remember, they're the partisan ones who got there with the current system. Why would they change it? So change on this is going to have to come from the outside as a, as a ballot measure or something. But it's it's out there. Okay, so two big types of campaign finance reform. First, limit fundraising. And that's what the federal laws do. They say uh, there's a limit on the amount any individual can give to a national race. So there you go. Um, it exists all over the country. Oregon doesn't have it. We're one of five states with no limits whatsoever. Biggest issue becomes what that limit ought to be. Um, the limit at the national level did not change for about 30 years. Uh, and Newt Gingrich, when he was Speaker of the House, uh, eventually pointed out that because we hadn't changed the, the limit, 
um, we were actually uh, making it so that members of Congress running were even more beholden to finding donors because they had to get more of them to kind of do the same thing. Um, and so now that that that's a it's it's moves more or less with inflation, not automatically, but Congress is paying attention to it. But where that limit ought to be, in Oregon, uh, people may recall in the mid '90s we had a rather low limit in place, and that led to loopholes. And the big loophole then was there was a limit on what you as a candidate for the state legislature could could raise. But there was no limit on any outside group that might want to support you on what they could raise and they could spend. And so we had interest groups that basically adopted people who were running for the state legislature, even if the people who were adopted, the candidates, didn't want to be adopted. And so you can't coordinate between those or anything. And so the message that the group was sending may not have been the message that the candidate wanted to run on. Uh, the Oregon Supreme Court threw that out at the time because it violated our constitution. Uh, but that's something that now that we can do this, we got to pay attention to this kind of stuff. So that does those loopholes become a big, big, big issue. So other side of campaign finance reform, limit spending. So 50 years ago, there was a gubernatorial race that was going on in 1974. Um, and, uh, it ended up between uh, Vicatia, who I wrote writing the book about, finished writing the book, it's with the publisher, uh, and Bob Straub. Bob Straub won. They had campaign finance limits on what they could spend. And so if you look at, and I keep track of these things, kind of what the spending is over time, that's a real low one, simply because they could only go up to this number and that was it. Um, and so the election took place, Bob Straub won. Um, and then the Supreme Court threw out those limits. And so four years later, they both ran against each other again, and they got to raise a lot more money, and their campaigns were much more lively and all that kind of stuff. But it's it's limiting spending is another thing that we look at for campaign finance reform. Key issue with this as well, what about independent spending? Um, independent spending is just because groups have free speech or freedom of expression. They have the same rights as the candidate does. So what do you do about that? How do you control that? At the national level in the United States, we have also ceded some of what an independent group is to the IRS. You hear about the groups where we, we can't figure out who's giving them money. It's because they're registered basically as a nonprofit, but in such a way that they only have to uh, tell us a certain number of individuals and everything else is protected and it's private because they're a group. Why? What's not our business to know? And so we have this, this it, people call it dark money and other things. Um, who's behind the independent spending? That becomes an issue. We have that in Oregon. Uh, there, there's a, there's anytime we have a ballot measure, especially there's a, an independent spending group who we can't figure out who the money is coming from, who's involved somehow. And it's it, involved in a bunch of things in, in the Portland area. Um, so it's 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 growing in importance, but limiting spending that's the second type. So as we go to questions, I know you're going to have good questions, but keep this in mind: these are really hard issues. They don't lend themselves to ballot measures because ballot measures don't go through the rigorous back and forth and really looking at details that a legislative process does. But remember, the legislature often has very little incentive to make these changes. So politically, it ought to be with the people, but the people don't do as good a job in figuring out exactly how this is all gonna work out than a legislature does. So it, that makes it even harder. Remember Arrow's theorem, mathematically, you can't come up with a perfect system, so what do you wanna do? So what are the, any change you wanna do, what are the positives, what are your goals, what are the negatives? Is something in there going to get in the way of your goal, get in the way of what you want to do? How do you take that into account? So those are things that that I, if, you know, teaching my students, this is what I want them to think about and 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 then go out in the, the world and try to solve these kinds of problems. So let's stop there and open it up for questions. Thanks, Jim. Um, do you want to go ahead and stop sharing your screen yes. so we can see you finally? Figure out zoom again 
I see All right. Lost. <laughs> I get it. Wireless things sometimes stop wirelessing. What are you going to do? There you go. Boop. There Got you it. are. Yay. We can see you now. All right. We're going to move to Q&A. So um, Amy, that's in the back of the room, and myself both have microphones. Um, as Linda mentioned, uh, try to keep your question um, short and a question. Um, and we will see what we can uh, get through today. So I think we've got one ready to go, and then a few more. Yeah, Professor Moore, I'm Tom Hall. Uh, go Boxers. <laughs> uh, my question has to do with this low unaffiliated turnout rate. Yeah. Down to 30% versus the 90% from the parties. What was the impact of Oregon's motor voter law on producing such a low turnout since we registered a lot of people that really didn't want to be registered? Yeah, there's, de it, there's a definite connection, but it's, a, it's an interesting connection. The turnout before Motor Voter was about 20 to 25% lower partisan to unaffiliated. So if there was 80% turnout here, you'd expect 60% turnout or 55% for the unaffiliated voters. Now it's more. 60 percent, or there's a there's that 30 percent difference there. The other side of it, though, is with Motor Voter, and that has increased increased the size of our electorate profoundly. But we're getting absolutely a larger number of voters actually voting. So, I you know once again I do graphs on all this stuff. So if you look at turnout, um, when we get to Motor Voter. Turnout actually not in percentage terms, but actually people who cast ballots, it goes up at a higher rate than it was going before. So we're physically getting more people to vote, but our percentage is lower because when people register to vote, and this has been going on since the early 1990s, more than half the people who register to vote register as unaffiliated. Um, and that has, it's continuing actually increasing because of motor voter. Um, so we have to balance that and that's the reality right now. It's something as an educator and, and someone who does this analysis, it's really interesting to me. Could we, for instance, have better outreach to these voters saying, hi, you're registered now. Here's what that means. It'd be great if you could take part with a personal touch work. Um, or is it simply that people who are automatically registered are people who have such a low interest in the political system, they say, yeah, whatever, and will never take part. We've There's, got another we've question. We've got to learn more about what's going on there. Yeah, Professor, this is uh, Chris Piper. And uh, my question is, uh, looking at the three areas that you identified in the closing under questions on positive and negative impact, yeah. um, one area that are subject comes up is is uh, the word of trust yeah and so my question is how have the reforms uh, impacted public confidence and trust in the electoral system um, and follow up do you believe the ranked choice voting will rebuild that trust yeah so it there's kind of before Trump trust and after Trump trust so in the systems that were in place before Trump came along we did see that there was a rebuilding of trust in the system if you had one of these reforms. And open primaries was a classic example of that. Um, people said, oh yeah, you know, I, I can now take part in it. Trump has, has uh, basically sowed distrust into the system. And so anything that's happened since then, it's hard to tell if trust has come up or down because it's so partisan right now. It's so identified with, it, with, uh, with Trump himself. So whatever happens to the election, three years from now, ask me again, and we'll, we'll have a better answer there. Um, in terms of ranked choice, ranked choice has been actually a way to rebuild trust at the local level. We see some evidence from cities, especially in the Bay Area, um, a couple of other places in the country where they really looked at, we put in ranked choice voting. It actually has rebuilt trust there because people say, oh, yeah, even though my candidate uh, didn't make it through, my third place person did make it onto the city council, I feel connected to the city council. We don't really have anything that looks at a larger entity like a state yet, but the local stuff is actually pretty promising in terms of ranked choice voting. Uh, all right, we have another question. 
Yeah, you know, I'm Greg Bryant, and uh, what I, my question is, shouldn't there be more education like in the high school? Because I think there's a lot of civics classes that have been <laughs> discontinued. Uh, they need a lot more education so because government is complicated and voting for people, they don't, you know, it's confusing sometimes. Yeah, you know, education at all levels, um, but that people, we're in, in the education system, and I'm in the education system, we're in a STEM world right now. We want people who are scientists, technologists, mathematicians. That's the world that we want. And so things like civics education go by the wayside. Um, we, we, we absolutely need education at all levels and continuing education. You know, things that, that your group does is great. Um, getting it out to the wider population is hard, but those kinds of things need to happen. Um, there's a there's a truism in social sciences, and we certainly see it in politics. When you put in some new way of doing things, it often does not increase the number of people who are involved. What it does is give the people who would be involved simply another way, and maybe a better way, to continue to be involved. We got to break out of those people who say, "Wow, it's my business to be civically engaged," and get more people into that. At the university, I keep fighting for you know every member of our, our College of Education uh, student should have a class from somebody like me about what a school board is and how it works, because you're gonna be teaching, reading and all that, but the school board is so important to your working conditions and everything else, you need to figure, you need to figure that out. And in Oregon, what does the state legislature do that controls your K through 12 budget? You need to know that, uh, but it's an uphill battle. It's a real uphill battle. Cool, hey, Gen Z here. Uh, <laughs> oh, my name is Billy, not just Gen Z. All right. Uh, <laughs> That's good. You represent the entire generation, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm just always wondering, why does all of politics have to just be a winner-take-all mentality <laughs> with, like, the budget, with voting power, with everything? Like, here's an like a little analogy. Like, if everybody just decided, like, oh, there's only one fast food joint that's allowed in town, and every year everybody argues about which one fast food joint is allowed in town, sometimes yeah. it's Burger King, sometimes it's McDonald's, wouldn't we all think that's ridiculous? Like, why can't we just have both and the budget gets split between both? Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great point. And, and uh, with groups like this, I point out that the United States, which prides itself on having the oldest constitution in the world and the oldest voting system in the world, um, no other country has copied what we do. There are no other electoral colleges anywhere else in the world, believe me. So in uh, 19, the early 1950s, political scientists looked at exactly this question, World War II, we're beginning to have the economic boom, et cetera, and asked the same question, and they said, aha, here's the solution. The solution is basically to go to a parliamentary system with multiple members for districts. And uh, that has sat on the shelf with a place of honor in the American Political Science Association since 1951. It's not going anywhere. But that's one way in which you solve the system. And in the United States, we could do that. The Constitution for Congress simply says each state gets X number of members of Congress. It doesn't say how you have to split up those districts. If you do have districts, you got to do things like have equal populations and things like that. We could easily say here in Oregon, guess what? We have one district, six seats. Everybody vote. We'll figure it out. And the chances are very good that we would have better representation in there because there might be a chance for the random libertarian to make it in there. Um, there's the counter to that, though, is that we might end up where uh in in not in oregon because we're split with if we if we take all the unaffiliated voters out it's about 60 democrats 40 republicans so you'd expect a a, a that kind of a split in in the six um, but there are other states where there are so few especially democrats in places like idaho where you'd end up with no democrats ever in congress um and so the multiple member idea is a pretty powerful one. You could take it a little bit too far. Um, you heard all the international stuff that I do. Um, I've been giving talks to people about Israel and Hamas. Now, that's an exciting topic and one where you have to tread pretty carefully. Um, but 
Israel itself is a single legislative district with 120 seats in its parliament. And so if you're a major political party, you put up 120 people, proportionally, you get the top third or the top 25% or whatever it is on your list. That's one way to do it. It's been pretty successful. In the United States, though, we're first past the post, one person in a district. And because of that, it creates a need for political parties to concentrate resources. And it also makes us the winner loser thing. Your analogy with the fast food places is, is brilliant because that's what we're living with. That's what we're living with. All right, next question. I was wondering if you could talk about the way in which the ranked choice voting on the ballot measure will turn out for local elections. So will it be applied to city councils and everything else? And then when, if it's voted on in November, when will it first be utilized? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, as far as I can tell, and I have not looked at every word in it, it's just for state elections. Um, I have the answer I, here. I'm not with sure on that. Is, is, is it for local? Because I'm thinking of it, it might overrule Portland's if it goes in. Do you, do you know better on that end? Hi, Dr. Moore. Uh, Steve Dennison, County Clerk. Um, <laughs> thanks. And Nancy Blankenship, retired county clerk. So uh, a little you bit of know. knowledge locally on, um, here. But yeah, the, the bill was written. Um, it, it could apply locally uh, if, okay. if the jurisdictions uh, chose to adopt it. Um, okay. But yeah. And yeah, I, so if they choose to adopt it. Yes. Yeah. And so um, when does it go into effect? It'll, it'll be in the bill itself. 2028, um, January 1. Yeah, January 1. Um, it, it would go into effect. The bill itself, though, or the, the, the ballot measure itself, I'm not sure has that good a chance of passing. And the reason is in Oregon, we tend to have great ideas in ballot measures. They go out there, they poll pretty well, and then the people who oppose them say, gosh, you know, but there's one fatal flaw to this thing. And they chip away at, at the support for the bill. And that happens all the time. When we get ballot measures, only about a third of them pass. And I have a feeling that there will be, uh, there are enough interests that don't want this that I think there could be a lot of chipping that goes on. I don't know that at this point, and nobody's really lined up to you know, say which groups are, are for and against and raising money. But um, I will be happily surprised because I'm an election guy. I like this kind of stuff. I think it does have a chance to bring in more voters. That's what I want. Um, I would be happily surprised if it passed, but I, I, I'm not sure that it's on that path. Uh, hello. Um, I, I, let, me, let me start with a disclaimer. First off, I am a candidate in the race that I want to ask about, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, in November 2022, uh, the voters of Deschutes County decided to make county commissioner a nonpartisan position. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a little bit like having an open primary. Um, mm -hmm. So we will have a, an election in May this year where everyone, non-affiliates, libertarians, green parties, what have you, they, they all get to vote in a county commissioner race when they have not been able to before. So I'm curious if you have any predictions for us on what that will actually do to turnout uh, in that election, which historically county commissioner races in, in May in Deschutes County, all we had were D's and R's voting. Right. If you look around the state, it's not going to make that much difference at all because the people who are casting their ballots are there because of the, the big partisan ones at the top of the, of the ballot. Um, however, it's your first one that, that could yes. raise turnout because people say, oh, I get to take part in this. That's great. Um, it'll be up to you and your campaign to make that case. Um, when you look at other places around the state, you know, once again, I'm in Washington County, you know, uh, same type of system. It, the, the, the things that drive turnout in the primary here are good statewide races or the occasional primary challenge for somebody in the state legislature. Um, that, that's what really drives turnout, or a congressional primary. 
it's not the county commission and the and the you know those kinds of things that are that are nonpartisan. So you need to hype it up. Um, say hey, welcome in everybody in the pool. It's a primary. Take part. Your first chance. Uh, and and I think that that has a chance to raise turnout. But the experience around the state is it's the partisan races at the top of the ballot that really drive turnout. All right, another question, Molly. Uh, to your your point of encouraging more people to vote, I noticed that for the upcoming session, uh, Senate Bill fifteen eighty nine has been introduced and it ends voter by mail, uh, generally by requiring in-person voting. It would require people to vote in person on the day of the election for the most part. There would be exceptions for veterans, et cetera. Uh, this bill was introduced by some of our local politicians, Werner Reschke from Lapine, Breeze Iverson, Findlay, et cetera. Can you comment on what might be a motivation behind that? Sure. When at the top of this, when I said my bias is to get more people in, but there's a perfectly legitimate bias out there to limit the number of people who are voting, that's what it is. We're seeing exactly that kind of legislation, and it's Republicans now, but if this were 60 years ago, to be Democrats doing the same thing. Um, it just happens to be living in the Republican Party right now. It's legislation exactly like this in, in a great many states where Republicans are powerful around the country. Um, this one, I would it would not surprise me if it's off the shelf. There's a group called ALEC that works with conservative legislators to to give them ballot measures or give them laws. Wouldn't surprise me if it's off the shelf from one of them. Um, so yeah, no surprise whatsoever. Uh, there's another argument to voting though on election day, and I was I'm still strongly in favor in my heart, but I've seen the results of vote by mail, and so in my head I say no, I don't think so. We miss the town square. We miss going to the the you know the high school gym and casting your vote and seeing other people do it. We miss that idea that it's it's not quite a civic holiday, but it's we're in this together. Um, that turns out when we look at the evidence of that, that was about four or five percent of all the electorate across the country, and everybody else thought it was a real pain to have to go to the high school gym, and they wanted to vote by mail. Um, so I don't think it, it goes anywhere, but it's something that we're seeing from Republicans now. But remember, if this were 60 years ago, you'd be seeing the same thing from Democrats trying to limit the number of people who vote or the type of people who vote. So it's, it's, it's on that side of the equation. And our last question. Uh, Terry Reynolds here. Um, thank you very much. This is very informative. I love hearing from you. I read what you, <laughs> what you write. Um, I, I have a million questions. One is, what are your thoughts on how to deal with the dark money? How do we, um, you know, is there legislation? Is there, you know, do we get people together to, you know, get deal with it? Yeah, so to deal with the dark money, legislatures and Congress have to get together and say, this is under the control of the election system, not the IRS or the Oregon Taxing Authority. So if you're taking part in politics, we need to know who you are, period, end of discussion. So that'll mean uh, rewriting things and uh, you know coming up with maybe new ways in which organizations are formed, but that, that's what has to happen. We're in effect mixing our tax system and our election system, and that's where the mess really comes from. However, remember, kind of like other things that I've been alluding to here, uh, people want to really control money in elections. Money is going to find a way to influence things, uh, no matter what. It's it's uh, You just kind of have to go for the biggest gushers and try to stanch them, but money is still going to work its way into the system and try to, try to get its own results in any given election. All right, Jim, we're actually going to squeeze in one last one, <laughs> and this will be our last one. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is John Gilbert, City Club member, and uh, disclosure, I'm on the uh, board of All Oregon Votes, which is uh, working to bring open primaries to Oregon. Yeah. Um, so with regards to what's on the horizon, we, you've talked about ranked choice voting coming uh, in front of us in November. Can you just, uh, this is a little bit of a follow-up on the last question. Uh, with regards to campaign finance reform and an independent, independent redistricting. 
Yeah, are, you're are we going to see uh, initiatives or ballot measures um, this in this November on either of those two topics? Uh, yeah, independent redistricting, I don't think we're going to see anything. Campaign finance reform, we will. The question is, will there be two? One from the good government folks like Common Cause, one from the unions, or will there be one, which is what the legislative leadership really wants to have happen? So apparently behind closed doors now, those two campaign finance groups are talking with each other so they can get a single measure that will go to the legislature in this short, short session. The legislature can then say, fine, we pass it to go to the voters. We will have a single campaign finance bill or a measure on the ballot in November. If not, it looks like we're going to have two. I have no doubt they'll be able to raise the signatures and do everything else. Um, and so you'll have to figure out which one you like better. And uh, it hasn't happened that often, but apparently the rule is whichever one gets the most votes is the one that actually goes into law and the other one doesn't. So it could be an interesting uh, time in November figuring that out. Thank you so much. You're welcome. This has been great. I wish I could be there in person to see all of you. <laughs> um, hopefully we can find a uh, topic someday to get you over here, maybe in the, the summer or spring. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, Professor Moore, for leading us in conversation today. And thank you to our planning team, A.B. Sabadini, Heather Barton, um, and Janet Greger for organizing today's forum. Uh, as um, mentioned in opening comments, if you have questions about City Club, we have a number of volunteers in the room uh, that can help answer those as well as myself. Uh, their diversity and experience are what brings this organization strength and vitality. Um, if you enjoy the conversations you have at forums, serving on a committee is taking it to the next level. We have wonderful and in-depth and uh, conversations there that uh, help plan this, uh, these forums as well as uh, lead the organization. Our next City Club Forum will be on March 21st. It will be uh, COCC and OSU Cascades, the heart hub and drivers of Central Oregon. Member re membership registration for that is now open and non-membership registration will um, open next week on our website. Um, City Club exists with your support and of, of our members, donors, and sponsors. If you um, enjoy these forums and uh, enjoy being a member, we hope that you'll consider um, um, deeper support. And then if you're a non-member, we'll hope you uh, consider joining. Thank you so much for joining us today in this first and probably only ever uh, hybrid format uh, that uh, we pivoted to yesterday. So thank you so much for coming and enjoying conversation. Drive safe. Thank you.